Welcome to this conversation with Professor Kin Hammond at uh, New Mexico State, and he's also one of the co-founders of Pivot to Peace, a very important voice um, in the peace movement and uh, a very, uh, you know, a studied scholar when it comes to uh, the history of Asia, the history of the world, and uh, U.S. militarism. Uh, Kin, uh, welcome, uh, and thanks for uh contributing your time to uh, breaking down Kirk Campbell's record in the new arms race. Sure thing. Glad to be here. So, uh, you know, I want to start by essentially spelling out, you know, why you think the Biden administration um, uh, is tapping Kirk Campbell to be Deputy Secretary of State and what kind of politics Campbell represents. Um, I mean, a lot of it revolves around the pivot to Asia. Um, of course, you know, the pivot to Asia has its roots in the Obama administration. And, you know, one can argue the U.S. has long been targeting Asia, you know, from Millard Fillmore sending Commodore Perry to threaten Japan with gunboat diplomacy, uh, colonizing the Philippines in 1898 and for decades after, and the Korean and Vietnam Wars, but there's been an understanding maybe since the start of the 21st century that the U.S., um, from the point of view of militarists in Washington, that they put the Asia-Pacific on the back burner, and they had this pivot to Asia, which Kurt Campbell was a big part in orchestrating. So walk us through what that exactly meant, the pivot to Asia, and what was Campbell's role in it? Sure. Um, I mean, Kurt Campbell is is often seen, or at least certainly sort of represents himself uh, as well, as uh, sort of the the intellectual side of the neoconservative, uh, you know, foreign policy perspectives here in the United States, and he really played a very significant role in the in the you know pivot to Asia, as it was called. Uh, in fact, wrote a book called The Pivot uh, a couple of years after uh, that all got launched. Um, He's he is often referred to as the architect of American policy, contemporary American policy towards uh, towards Asia. And of course, when they say Asia, what they really mean is primarily China. Uh, it looks at at Asia, uh, but primarily uh, the focus is China, and the and the objective is to sort of mobilize uh, other resources, including primarily American military resources, around Asia and redeploy them in Asia from elsewhere. Uh, in order to, you know, contain and and constrain uh, China's development, and this, you know, this of course takes place uh, back around 2011. Uh, President Obama at that time announces the pivot to Asia. Uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton writes an article uh, in Foreign Policy advocating for uh, a a new American Pacific century. The idea of of you know revising or reviving. Uh, American dominance, especially in the Western Pacific. And again, what that means is encircling China, focusing on on China. And I think I think, you know, sort of the macro context in which that, you know, this makes sense and we can we can understand kind of where they're coming from, what their motivations are, um, has has sort of two tracks. Uh, one, as as you alluded to there, uh, is that right at the beginning of of the twenty first century, of course, uh, with with the the events of of uh, 9/11, uh, you know, American uh, strategic activity shifted really intensely to the so-called war on terror. Uh, you know, the invasion uh, and occupation of of uh, Iraq, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, uh, other kinds of of military ramping up in the Middle East, and the focus for a while was primarily on. Uh, uh, on, on, you know, attacking Islamic uh, uh, radicalism, so-called, and all that. Uh, but at the same time, that was a period, the, the end of the 20th century and the first decade, say, of, of the present century, where the United States felt, American political elites felt um, fairly confident in how their efforts to integrate China into the global capitalist system were working out. Uh, you know, China had 
launched its program of a reform and opening to the outside, bringing in, allowing foreign capital to come in, collaborating with international organizations, joining the World Trade Organization, things like that. All that had gone on through the 80s and the 90s and carrying on into the early 21st century. And the objective really for the United States was to have China become a kind of subordinate, integrated cog in the global capitalist machinery dominated by the United States. And down to the early 21st century, it appeared in some ways that that, uh, that objective was, was being attained. Uh, China, in order to gain access to technology and capital and all these kinds of things, um, had adopted a fairly accommodating stance towards the United States, towards the global capitalist system. Deng Xiaoping had urged back in the early 90s, he'd urged the Chinese leadership, uh, as he put it, to bide their time and build their capacities, build their capabilities. Meaning not to not to push, not to not to be confrontational with the United States, to sort of de-emphasize uh, uh, or at least not, you know, foreground um, the the socialist uh, nature of China's development and China's economy, but to sort of go along and get along in order to you know achieve the developmental objectives that they that they had prioritized. That begins to change in the first decade of this century because China had successfully pursued its development. We all know that there were 20 years of double digit growth every year, 10, 11, 12% annual growth in gross domestic product. And so by the early 21st century, China was able to begin to sort of stand on its own two feet again and no longer felt the necessity to you know, completely kind of kowtow to, to the West. And that gets demonstrated in 2008 when China weathers the, the global financial crisis without, without too much difficulty. They have disruptions in the domestic economy, but they deal with those. They, the, the socialist core of their system buffers that in terms of workers. And they're able to redirect economic resources in ways that got China through that much better than, uh, than the economies of the West. And I think that some of the analysts and, and, and leaders in Washington um, saw that and realized or began to have a glimmer that maybe China wasn't going to have a color revolution or take the capitalist road or just become, a, you know, as I said, a cog in the capitalist machinery, but really was going to pursue its own sort of agenda. And I think that's what leads Obama uh, and Clinton and and certainly Kurt Campbell to to push for this this pivot to Asia, saying you know look we kind of got the 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 Islamic terrorist thing down you know we we we're occupying these countries where we have major forces in the area, let's get back to the real critical issue going forward, which is China. So the focus is is back on now you know well if China's not going to obey us if China's not going to you know, uh, subordinate itself to us, then what are we going to do about it? We're going to have to isolate them, try to slow down their development if we can't just totally derail it and, uh, and, and, and you know, keep them, keep them boxed in. And that's what the pivot to Asia is all about. And so when, when, when Kurt Campbell says he's not, you know, trying to, to attack China or, or, you know, have an antagonistic thing in China, he's just trying to, you know, maintain the, the, the rules-based international order, that is, of course, a, an order which is based on rules that the United States makes in order to perpetuate its own leadership and its own power. And the Chinese aren't playing that game anymore, especially now since Xi Jinping has been in, in the leadership. Uh, and so, you know, that, that antagonism has only deepened. And that makes Kurt Campbell one of the key figures because he is, you know, he's the sort of, as I say, the sort of intellectual articulation of that policy, making it sound, you know, sort of, uh, real politic or pragmatic or whatever, but it's really about perpetuating American dominance in the global system. Mm. I appreciate you uh, laying that foundation in that historical context. Um, you know, in particular, I think about how, you know, uh, Campbell, you know, co-founded the Center for New American Security or CNAS, and that um, think tank, they simulate war games between China and the United States. And, you know, this is essentially 
uh, contributed to uh, a new arms race. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's like, you know, historical, I, I think, scenarios which are very worrisome um, and precedents which were really worrisome. Like, you know, there's the history of World War One, how before Germany and Russia, sorry, Germany and the UK were in an arms race like that. And then that ended <laughs> with a with a world war. And then also the Cold War arms race, the one, you know, from the you know, nineteen forties to the nineties, uh, that one was also devastating, especially for the global south. So, you know, with those precedents, what can this new twenty first century arms race lead to? Well, I think I think those are important uh, historical uh, examples to bear in mind, especially the 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 nineteen eighties uh, arms race, the Reagan era arms race, because when when Ronald Reagan becomes president, you know he really was a a, a quite violent anti communist, and even though you know he was happy to shake hands with uh, with Gorbachev and and have pictures taken and all that, uh, really his his overlying objective. Uh, was to destroy the Soviet Union, to destroy socialism, and to you know try to open up as much of the planet as possible to American capital. American capital was already in a kind of crisis in the 1970s. Uh, you know, a, a competition with Japan and Germany, uh, the saturation of American uh, uh, markets. You know, and and so the idea of sort of opening up new areas for investment, for capital, you know, valorization. This was really critical for if the American economy was going to try to you know get back into a more dynamic phase. So he launches this arms race with the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and what's amazing about it is in many ways, it was kind of a, it was kind of just a facade, you know, that, that a lot of the systems, these, you know, Star Wars, laser weapons and all this stuff, most of that stuff never worked. You know, uh, they, they invested billions and billions of dollars in development, but that wasn't really the point. The point wasn't to have systems that worked. The point was to drive the Soviet Union into a competitive posture, which forced them to divert uh, resources uh, from the civil society, from the consumers. You know, the consumer standards of living had been rising in the Soviet Union since the 1950s pretty steadily. But that gets derailed because the leadership there decided that they had to compete with the United States. They couldn't get the United States get let you know get this strategic edge. And so that undermined support for the for the government, support for the party, and it led to the crisis that eventually does uh, bring down the, the the East European socialist states, the the Soviet Union, and and you know gives rise to this triumphalist end of the Cold War, uh, and that you know from from strictly a, a a neutral sort of historical perspective, Reagan's strategy worked. Reagan's uh, approach to that worked. Uh, but there's a fundamental difference between that historical moment and the one in which we find ourselves now, which which is simply that China is not the Soviet Union. You know, China has already reached levels of material development and levels of of economic um, equity, I suppose you would say, raising, you know, 800 million people out of poverty. Uh, uh, you know, not that everybody's living high off the hog, but but, you know, people's basic needs uh, are taken care of. And they've, they've developed an amazing healthcare system, as we saw, that saved literally millions of lives during the COVID pandemic. They've got an educational system that now is world class. Their research and development is the best on the planet. They're leading in the fight against climate change and global warming. There's all these things that China has achieved. And it has, you know, the, the, the government and the party leadership there have massive support from ordinary people in China uh, in a way that that certainly by the by the height of the arms race with the Soviet Union, the, the Soviet leadership lost, right? They lost that mass support. And that's the fundamental difference, that China's not going anywhere, you know? This, these efforts, this arms race, it, it's, it's classic strategy. It's like, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna ramp things up. We're gonna spend money. We're gonna, you know, engage in all this activity. And of course, dumping, the existing stockpiles of old weaponry at places like Ukraine or, you know, giving it to Israel or whatever we're doing with it to make sure that we have as many wars going as possible. You know, all that, this is this is just party time for the for the military industrial complex. That 
that's one strategy. And that's something that, you know, they're the Cold War leadership that we have, like like Joe Biden, who is one of the last true Cold Warriors, they think they're going to replay that same scenario. But that is not, it's just, that's not who the players are now. That's not, that's not what's going to happen now, uh, which makes it an extremely dangerous policy because China, you know, they're certainly, their military capabilities have been enhanced in recent years. They're not an aggressive military, but they are certainly prepared to defend themselves in ways that I think the United States is only beginning to, to take seriously. So that makes it a very, very dangerous kind of moment uh, because war could break out. All these provocations in the South China Sea and around Taiwan and all this stuff, all the hateful rhetoric that gets directed about China, uh, you know, it creates a situation where, you know, as, as Chairman Mao used to say in a very different way, a single spark can start a prairie fire. And that means that, you know, things can run off the rails. The lesson maybe from World War I uh, is that if you're at that level of intense confrontation and intense militarization, even if it's only largely on one side, a minor event can trigger things that lead to a maximalist global conflagration. And now, of course, you know, we all know that with nuclear weapons, what that means is, is not just a lot of people, you know, fighting on battlefields, but potential destruction of, of much of the human race. So it's mm -hmm. a super dangerous strategy. And again, here's, here's Kurt Campbell right at the heart of that. You know, the, the Center for New American Security, his time at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, all of these have been efforts on his part to articulate a a rationale, uh, a justification for these policies that doesn't take seriously the kind of existential threat that they pose. Yeah, I feel like, especially with regards to, you know, the um, strategy of proxy wars uh, as a way to provoke conflict, uh, you know, um, at China's Our Enemy, we've spoken to folks from Okinawa, folks from uh, you know, around the Asia Pacific, folks from Guam, um, and the uh, strategy, Campbell's strategy of militarizing these places, you know, creates fears amongst people who live there that they that they're going to be targets. They're going to be the first casualties, and either people like what if it's in the case of you know U.S. occupied Guam, people who are are colonized and have no wish to be part of a, uh, you know, Cold War power rivalry. Um, and also in cases like the Philippines or Japan um, or in Korea, you know, they also don't want to be in the middle of something like this, something like a, a conflict between two powers. So, you know, as, if Campbell actually becomes Deputy Secretary of State, what would his policies mean for those communities and places like U.S. occupied Guam and in places like the Philippines, where you know we've just set up new military bases or um, set up an agreement to create more places like Papua New Guinea, um, in Okinawa. What of those places? Well, I think that that the you know the 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 pivot to Asia, the the whole uh, uh, I suppose we could call it sort of the Campbell Doctrine almost uh, is one of of deploying more and more military assets, as they like to call them, military resources, whether that's weapon systems going to Taiwan or actual bases being established or expanded, uh, and, and to get as many places as possible, you know, it, it, with a kind of, you know, they talk about the first island chain, and then there's a sort of second line of all this, because there's an understanding at some level, especially on the part of, of uh, you know, serious military people over at the Pentagon, that uh, you know, a war with China isn't going to be something that is going to be a walkover, you know, and so you know they want to have, I suppose you would say, some depth. So you know, yeah, bringing in places like Papua New Guinea, bringing in, you know, there's there's been so much anxiety recently on the part of the, the foreign policy elites about uh, you know China's activities in in the in the Western Pacific, uh, you know, uh, developing better relationships, for example, with the Solomon Islands. Uh, you know, the United States has been ignoring those countries, those island countries in, in the Western Pacific, who incidentally, of course, find themselves 
uh, is, uh, among the most vulnerable places in the world to rising sea levels, global warming, climate change, all this, about which the United States is doing nothing. Uh, in fact, less than nothing, continuing to ramp up its 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 carbon production. But you know, now suddenly the United States is interested in the Western Pacific again. We've got an embassy in the Solomon Islands again, which we haven't had since the 1970s. You know, and 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 it's you know, people out there understand that this is completely a function of wanting to use them uh, as as buffers. Uh, against China and that and that you know whether it's frontline situations like Japan or Okinawa or Korea Taiwan or you know a little bit further back it's all part of a package it's all part of a of a of a network of bases and and assets of other kinds and and some of it is of course is like intelligence assets listening stations listening posts things like that which are scattered around in Southeast Asia it's it's trying to create a a, an all-encompassing net, if you will, that they can then sort of tighten to try to to try to constrain China. And and once again, it's 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 a fool's errand. China is going about its business. It has its own international engagements. It's been very successful in developing its relationships with countries in other parts of Asia and Africa and Latin America. And and you know this is it, it's it, the United States is is kind of desperately trying to hang on to its hegemonic position. And, uh, you know, so a figure like Kurt Campbell, you know, becoming Deputy Secretary of State for, for Asia Pacific, at, at, on one level, it makes perfect sense because that's what both the major political parties want. That's what the Biden administration wants. That's what, you know, uh, that's what the Republicans want. You listen to Republican uh, senators and congressmen, they're, they're, you know, if anything, trying to trying to push even harder on those things. So having Campbell come into that position uh, you know, in some ways, it's it's the logical culmination of his whole career and this whole process of developing this. But it's a very dangerous prospect uh, for the American people, for the Chinese people, for people in, in other parts of Asia and the world. Uh, and, and, you know, what we need is is not just, I mean, we certainly it would be great to block Kurt Campbell's appointment, but also uh, it's we have to find ways to get the Biden administration or whoever comes in uh, in in in. Uh, January of, of 25, uh, to, to take seriously the idea that they need to find ways to cooperate and collaborate in the construction of a new and better world, rather than trying to hold on to the power and the privileges that they've enjoyed for so long. Mm, yeah, that's, that's a very, I think, um, uh, prescient understanding of, uh, of you know, what exactly the Campbell legacy um, amounts to and where it's headed. And you know, I, I also, uh, you know, would be remiss for like not um, uh, bringing up how when I attended Campbell's nomination hearing, he really also echoed a, a, a pan-global uh, foreign policy vision that uh, really includes a lot of uh, the same failed policies of armed intervention. Um, you know, he said that he wouldn't place conditions on sending arms to Israel, um, even though the, um, they're currently inflicting a, a genocidal war in Palestine. He said that, um, you know, he, uh, you know, proudly talked about his academic um, uh, background studying Soviet policy in Africa and said that he'd also be um, focusing on, you know, minerals um, on, in, in the African continent. And of course, that has lots of implications with AFRICOM, uh, what's happening in Somalia, what's happening in, in um, you know, Congo um, and other places. Uh, so in the, he, he even said that he wouldn't get back into the Iran deal. Um, uh, and I, I just have to ask, like, from your perspective, you know, is there any kind of like why do you think uh Campbell is rejecting diplomacy and opting for militarism um on all of these fronts when he's supposed to be uh you know essentially auditioning for a diplomatic position well <laughs> diplomacy you know diplomacy works if you have 
uh, sort of shared interests and what you're trying to do is find a path forward that that both parties or however many parties are involved in negotiations or in building an organization or a relationship, if they have a common agenda, they may have disagreements about how to pursue it, but you know those are things that can be worked out. Uh, and that's what diplomacy historically has largely been about. Even if it's a situation where you have you have you know states that perhaps have conflicting interests in a particular uh, area, uh, you know the, the the objective there should be to go in and, and figure out okay how can we how can we resolve this in a way that's going to yield the maximum benefit for both sides in a realistic sort of way. That's that's one kind of diplomacy. That's what diplomacy perhaps really ought to be. But the United States has sort of forfeited uh, its its position uh, as a as as a country that other countries are going to see uh, as having their interests at heart. Uh, the United States, especially as our domestic economy has has eroded and and declined, and as as our our you know global uh, uh, capital you know uh, uh, efforts. Have, uh, have have you know kind of faced some challenges, faced some some stalling out here and there, and as other centers of wealth production have have emerged and have have grown, so that the U.S. no longer is in its dominant position, uh, what we have still we we have two things. We have two major weapons to deploy. One is financial control. All these sanctions, this sanction regime that we run. Uh, you know, trying to hurt people in countries around the world so that they will be dissatisfied with their governments and force them either to be overthrown or to change. That system hasn't worked, but we remain dedicated to to sanctioning everybody we can possibly think of. But the real muscle, of course, is is military. And the United States remains a, a tremendously powerful military society. We have our military industrial complex, of course, gets you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars in, in money from the American taxpayers uh, to, to you know, build all these weapons. And they got to go somewhere. If those companies are going to be profitable, somebody has to buy them and ideally use them, uh, you know, so that there'll be demand for more. So on the one hand, we have we have that driving uh, policy, the idea that, that we got, we got to keep cranking this military stuff out there. But also the only thing the United States has to persuade other countries to do what we want them to do is military force or the threat of military force. And so, you know, we see that playing out in, in, in Ukraine and Eastern Europe. We see that playing out uh, in Syria and the Middle East. We see it playing out in Africa. We see it playing out in other parts of the world. And of course, right now, you know, the, the most horrifying stuff going on with, with Israel's genocide uh, against uh, the Palestinian people and and the Biden administration and the Republicans in Congress seem absolutely dedicated to pouring as many billions as they can possibly come up with into the the Israeli war machine, and that's just you know it's it's obviously it's it's so wrong, but it's consistent with the idea that that's all we've got. That's the only real card that we have to play, and so. You know this organ, this this focus on on security and and security is just a code word for the military for militarization. That's been the focus of of Campbell's. That's been the backdrop, the underpinning of Campbell's approach all along. Uh, the pivot to Asia wasn't about let's redeploy economic development resources, let's redeploy humanitarian assistance. It was about military assets and building this this ring of containment around China. That's that's what they've got, and that's what they they have demonstrated they're willing to to use, that they're willing to sacrifice, especially other countries, people, uh, but also you know if necessary, uh, you know we'll send we'll send tens of thousands of American troops over, uh, as we did in Afghanistan and Iraq, even if in the end the outcome is is completely counter to what we said we were going to try to do. What happened to state building? What happened to humanitarian assistance? It's it it just that those programs were totally sidelined in the in the foregrounding of the deployment of, of brutal force. Mm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that perspective, uh, Professor. And, and you know, for me, it just really uh, is a good uh, reminder of why it's so important that we mobilize to uh, block Kurt Campbell's nomination for Deputy Secretary of State at a time when. 
Uh, there's escalations happening around the world. U.S. militarism is targeting so many people, um, targeting a country of 1.4 billion people like China. Um, another nuclear armed country is very, very dangerous. And I think, you know, it's uh, of the utmost importance that we actually work, as you were saying before, towards reconsidering our policy towards China and actually embracing diplomacy, cooperation, um, human-centered security. And, you know, I, I have to say that your perspective is um, a light in these very harrowing times. Um, so thanks so much for, for sharing everything you shared with us today. Well, it's been a, a pleasure being here and uh, nice, nice talking with you.